apologetics. Now, any of you familiar with what is apologetics? The defense of the faith. So apologetics is a branch of theology, and it's specifically concerned with defending the Christian faith. Apologetics. Uh, some people try to do apologetics because they figure that if they do it really well, they're going to convince a bunch of people to become Christians. And so you have books by, like, like Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, or The Case for Faith. And some Christians think, if I just get my non-Christian friends to read this, they become Christian. And so the non-Christian friend reads it, and what happens? They say, ah, that's fine for you. I don't buy it. Because you see, it's more, there's more to coming to faith than simply being convinced of the facts. So apologetics has its limits. You're not going to argue people into the faith. That's not going to happen. More on that down the road. But apologetics do serve a very, pretty valuable purpose. And one of the most valuable purposes is for Christians. Because who is it that reads a book like The Case for Christ and gets all fired up about it? Christians do. And Christians read C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, and they get encouraged by it because they say, this is so cool. Because what happens is, when we read that stuff, is it reinforces, I'm not an idiot to believe this. This is not irrational. It's not unreasonable. It's not illogical. It actually fits. It makes sense. It makes sense of the world as it really is. It is even scientific. And that's why we get excited about things like intelligent design. Because we've got scientists who are affirming some of the things that we hold fast. Now, does that mean intelligent designs are all Christians? Of course not. And so we take them for what they are. We take, find, take your friends where you can find them. And if you've got somebody who's saying, I think there's some brilliance behind this, okay, I'll agree with you to that point. Does that mean we're ready to you know, say we have the same faith? Absolutely not. But there is common ground. So apologetics has its purpose. And paying, paying attention to the cosmological and the teleological and the historical and the moral argument has value because it reinforces for Christians this stuff is true and God is consistent throughout his work. One of the other things I, we need to stress is the consistency of God's revelation. That God does not show one thing here and then something else here. There is a consistency of what's going on through the whole thing. So that's part of the value here. Now, there are some other arguments for the existence of God, which also kind of grow out of a general revelation. These, I said, were more empirical. And even the moral is kind of empirical. This is the, you actually do studies of cultures and kind of figure out what's going on and is there agreement or isn't there. And the moral argument tends to be an empirical, you judge this thing. There's a very fascinating argument for God, which is called the ontological argument. ontological argument. And the guy who first really gets credit for cooking this baby up is a guy named Anselm. And Anselm came from the 11th century, 12th, something like the, I think 1100 or late 1000s. So, long time ago. And Anselm came up with the ontological argument. Aquinas was in the 1300s, a couple hundred years after Anselm. Okay? So Anselm, I think, is 11s, somewhere in there. <coughs> so, the ontological argument goes like this. I can think of the greatest thing imaginable. So I start imagining the most powerful, almighty, greatest thing I could possibly imagine who can create everything and control everything and is in charge of everything. And if I visualize that greatest thing I can possibly imagine, there's only one thing that can make that thing greater than my imagination of it. And what would that be? For it to really exist. And so he argues, if I can imagine something greater than which nothing else is greater, the only thing greater than my imagination of that thing would be the thing itself, and the thing itself would be the greatest thing, and that would exist, and so God must exist. And it's kind of like, huh? Yeah, that's how it hits me too. But um, that's the ontological argument. And ontology comes from the Greek word ontos, which means being. So it's an argument from not what things are, but from being, okay? Not an empirical argument. It's a thought argument, and it's arguing that if the, the very essence of being is what God is all about, and if I can conceive of something great, that thing must really exist, otherwise it wouldn't be the greatest thing, and if I can think of the greatest thing, there must be a reason why I can think of the greatest thing, it's because it really is there. That's the ontological argument. It's an old argument. Some people find it fascinating and really compelling. I always find it kind of bizarre, Okay? But that's the classic ontological argument for the existence of God. And it fits more or less in here as well. 
for our experience, probably in our culture today, it's the most compelling arguments. If you're going to try to talk to somebody about, you know God really exists, probably the cosmological and teleological and the moral. Just the sense of rightness and wrongness. Where does that come from? Of course, there are arguments against that. People would say, yeah, it's all culture driven. It's just what you were taught. It's what, you know, that's why you believe these things. But we wouldn't say, no, there's a more fundamental <coughs> issue. It's, just, it's coming from somewhere. So these um, all come out of this sort of a um, sense of arguing. Cole mentions another one in here, and he talks about the emotional argument. And this would be, this is also probably a pretty popular one in our culture. The emotional argument is just that sense, that feeling of godness, a sense of God, the, the feeling. And so I have a feeling of encountering God, that God's there, and I've encountered him, and I, and I have this, this feeling of it. A guy named Rudolf Otto, about 100 years ago, wrote a book called The, the Quest for the Holy or something like that, The Quest for Holiness. No, I, I don't know what he called it. He called him The Holy, Das Heilige, The Holy. And um, Rudolf Otto traveled around the world and spent some time in India, and he realized that every single religion and every culture is always having the same goal, to kind of feel connected to God and have this feeling. And he said that, that feeling, that's coming from God, and that God is there for all of us. And he's a pure modernist looking for the great one overall truth, and we're all connecting into that. For him, it was the feeling of God, that sense of the numinous, the other than me. And... This is still pretty popular. Uh, you got a lot of people who are out there looking for that God feeling. In fact, I mean, you got a lot of people coming to Christian churches looking for that God feeling. And if it works for a while, that's cool. You know, I really feel God here. But then if it doesn't work, then they go look somewhere else. And they might look at the Jehovah's Witness church, or they might go looking at the Buddhist temple, or they might even go check out the Hindu. And then, oh, I found it. This was the big rage. Remember back in the 60s, those of you old enough to remember, you know, you had people running off trying to find themselves and learning the reality, and Eastern religions were all the rage, and you had the Beatles running off and sitting at the feet of the Maharishi for a while, you know, finding truth. And that's the same idea. They're looking for that God connection, that feeling of connectedness. And so the emotional thing is also part of the, the driving force of this thing. Now, <clears throat> ultimately, though, all of these different ways of general revelation or of kind of God showing himself just through the reality of what is all come up short because what we get from here is kind of a fragmented picture of God. You get glimpses of great beauty and you get hints of goodness and you get hints of wonderful creativity. I mean, you just walk over to the zoo and take a look at all the different animals running around and you go, wow, you know, what kind of creator God is this? And you see um, a sense of this, but you also get perplexed because you see, you know, death and you see decay and you see great destruction of storms or, you know, and, uh, physical forces in nature. You see man's cruelty and you see the, the breakdown of morality and you begin to wonder what kind of God would allow this. And so it's, it's perplexing and we get a rather mixed picture. So general revelation or natural revelation will only take you so far. And this is also why you'll get people who are, um, you know, just kind of paying attention to stuff who say, yeah, I must be a God, but boy, I don't want to believe in him because he seems arbitrary or he killed my mom, he didn't heal my sister, whatever. And they have a whole lot of baggage, a whole lot of hurts because the general revelation just doesn't get the job done. It won't do it, which is probably why handing an unbeliever, a book of Christian apologetics is not going to make him a Christian. Okay? It might silence some of their arguments, but if they're ticked off at God, you're not going to solve the problem by proving to them that they really must believe in God. They're just, just going to make him more angry, and it's not going, to, not, not going to deal with it. So general revelation has its purposes, but it only goes so far. Now, one other purpose before I leave this, because I want to leave it, it's done. Um, one other purpose of general revelation, one of the very useful things, is simply the idea of this common morality. And what I would call growing out of this natural law or natural world is the idea of a natural law. So in other words, there is a common foundation for all people in creation, and it's there. This is really very helpful, especially when we're living in a pluralistic age like we are, when 
you're trying to argue some issue of social morality. For example, okay, whether or not gay marriage is a good thing. All right? The Christian's temptation is to do what? He's making his case why gay marriage is wrong. What's the Christian tempted to stand up and say? God says it's wrong. Here's the verse. And they start quoting Bible verses. And all the Christians say, yeah, that's it. We're done. And all the non-Christians say, so what? That's your God. Who cares? And you're just, you know, closed-minded. You're trapped in a hopelessly narrow worldview. You've got to expand your worldview a little bit more. So if we're going to argue against the legitimacy of gay marriage, which I think is a legitimate thing to argue against, and we should argue against it, how do we do it? Don't quote the Bible. <laughs> Don't talk about what God says. Well, there's some of these other arguments, like it runs contrary to, to design and yeah. purpose. Yeah. So you see, in other words, you start making a case based on natural law, the things that are just there. It, and you, you can make a pretty good case for that. For example is, do we want, you know, is this a good thing for society? You know, you're obviously bucking the design of nature. How are you going to propagate children in this? You know, it doesn't work. Okay, you can't. And so you've got to have that doesn't work. So that you've got kind of arguing against it's the very design of creation itself, the teleological thing. You can also argue against the moral sense. People have a sense that it's wrong. Is this just coming because they were brought up in a repressive society, which is what the argument goes, or is it because we have a sense that this is just not the way it's supposed to be? And you're far better off appealing to people's internal gut morality of you just you know it's wrong. And most people are going to say. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I'm trying to be enlightened, but I just, it creeps me up. I know it's, I know it's not right. You know? And, and that's legit. That's, that's how you make a case. And then you also start arguing things like this just degrades society. It pulls society down. It's not advancing society. You can make historical arguments like, hey, what were the Romans doing shortly before they fell down the tubes? Oh, they were playing around with you know, all kinds of homosexual things. It was the standard. Uh, maybe there's a correlation. So you can make a really good natural law argument without bringing God or the Bible into it all. And we need to pay attention to that kind of stuff, especially the more we're living in this society. Paul himself did this. Remember when Paul showed up at the Areopagus in Athens? And what did he do? Did he get up to give a speech and start quoting scripture? No. He repealed to the unknown God. He said, I was walking through your, your city and I saw all these great temples and I even saw one to the unknown God. And he talked about the things that they just had figured out cosmologically, teleologically. That's where he started. And he began there, and then he worked his way. Finally, he got talking about Jesus and the resurrection, but that wasn't until the end. And that's when, you see, what he did was he built on the general revelation and brought it to the specific. So we need to pay a little more attention, I'm going to argue, to the general revelation and not be so quick to just be dismissive of it as it doesn't matter, who cares. It's more important than we sometimes realize. And we need to pay a little more attention to it. It matters. And the reason I would say it matters is because just because a heathen realizes something or makes the argument doesn't mean it's wrong. Aristotle discovered all kinds of truth. So did Plato. And just because they're not Christian doesn't mean they are idiots, they're not going to figure something out. Because God has simply built some of this stuff into the creation. Any fool who sits down and looks at it and starts thinking about it is going to often reach the conclusions God wants you to reach. They're all, they'll be right. So truth is to be found in all kinds of places. And we can, like I said, take your friends where you can find them. And people who are embracing the reality, the reality of God and the morality that comes with that, this is a good thing. Don't be so dismissive of it. All right. Now, 